And last week, we came up to Sutta number 3.4.36. I'd just like to add a few more comments about this Sutta. In this last Sutta, we heard about how the devas from the four great heavenly kings uh, heaven, uh, they circumambulate the world on the eighth of the lunar month. Uh, that means on the eighth day, the fifteenth day, the twenty-third and the thirtieth day, or sometimes twenty-ninth day uh, of the lunar month. They come and observe human beings in the world. And then they report to Sakadeva Raja and the other devas of the Tabatimsa heaven, the heaven of the 33. And they are interested to know whether human beings keep the precepts and pay respect to mother and father, to recluses and brahmins, to elders, and keep the eight precepts on the Sabbath days. On those uh, on those days. Now, here yeah, I like to say that uh, it is taught by the Buddha that we should, uh, on the eight days of the month, uh, the, the, of the lunar month, as we just mentioned, uh, the eighth, the fifteenth, twenty-third, and the thirtieth, uh, we should keep the eight precepts uh, because. Uh, as lay people, you don't have time to practice every day, but at least once a week on the average, the Buddha said, you should keep the eight precepts. And uh, the merit from that uh, will bring you very likely uh, to rebirth in the heavenly realms. That is why it is very important to keep the eight precepts. Now, nowadays, it is not so convenient as before to keep the eight precepts uh, on the eighth day, 15th, 23rd, and 30th day of the lunar month. It might be more convenient to keep it, say, on a Sunday when people are not working. And um, if you can go to the temple uh, or Vihara or Buddhist association to keep the precepts, it's very good. Uh, but if you can't, then you can practice it at home also, keep the eight precepts. By coming together on the, uh, say, once a week, uh, on the, say, Sunday, uh, to a temple, it's a very good way uh, for Buddhists to come together to unite. And uh, uh, it is quite important that Buddhists come together frequently, come together in harmony, and we can be more closely knit and support each other. Uh, the other thing about this sutta is why are the devas uh, of the heaven of the 33 so concerned about whether human beings keep their precepts and revere mother and father and elders? Because they mention here that if human beings keep the precepts and uh, pay respect to the elders, etc., and do good works, uh, that the devas will increase. Whereas if they don't do that, then the asuras will increase. And from here you can see yeah, that the heaven, the devas of the 33 heaven, they are not on good terms with the asuras. The asuras were originally in the Tabatimsa heaven, heaven of the 33, but they were displaced by Sakadeva Raja and the other uh, devas. Huh? So it, uh, it seems uh, in some other sutta, once a year, these asuras, uh, they, they, there's a time of the year when there's a huge big tree in the heaven of the 33, it blooms. It blooms and uh, the flowers are very fragrant and it goes a long way. And so when that tree blooms, uh, those devas in the 33, they enjoy themselves under that tree and uh, for for a few months. So the Asuras, they remember that they used to enjoy there and they, nowadays they don't have the chance. So they, they'll go up and try to fight with the uh, Devas of the heaven of the 33. And this is found in Buddhism. This is also found in Hinduism. And also in the Bible, eh, it's mentioned that uh, Michael the Archangel uh, drove the Satan and his host uh, out of the heaven uh, 
and that might be actually referring to this uh, Sakadeva Raja fighting with the Asuras. So that's all I have to say about that Sutta. Now we come to another Sutta, 3.4.38. The Buddha said, Monks, I was delicately nurtured, exceeding delicately nurtured, delicately nurtured beyond measure. For instance, in my father's house, lotus pools were made thus, one of blue lotuses, one of red, another of white lotuses, just for my benefit. No sandalwood powder did I use that was not from Kasi. Of Kasi cloth was my turban made. Of Kasi cloth was my jacket, my tunic and my cloak. By day and night a white canopy was held over me, lest cold or heat, dust or chaff or dew should touch me. Moreover, monks, I had three mansions, one for winter, one for summer, and one for the rainy season. In the four months of the rains, I was waited on by minstrels, women, all of them. I came not down from my mansion in those months. Again, whereas in other men's homes, broken rice together with sour gruel is given as food to slave servants, in my father's home they were given rice, meat, and milk rice for their food. To me, monks, thus blessed with much prosperity, thus nurtured with exceeding delicacy, this thought occurred. Surely one of the uneducated many folk, though himself subject to old age and decay, not having passed beyond old age and decay, when he sees another broken down with age, is troubled, ashamed, disgusted, forgetful that he himself is such a one. Now I too am subject to old age and decay, not having passed beyond old age and decay. Were I to see another broken down with old age, I might be troubled, ashamed and disgusted. That would not be seemly in me. Thus, monks, as I considered the matter, all pride in my youth deserted me. Again, monks, I thought, one of the uneducated many folk, though himself subject to disease, not having passed beyond disease, when he sees another person diseased, is troubled, ashamed, and disgusted, forgetful that he himself is such a one. Now I too am subject to disease. I have not passed beyond disease. Were I to see another diseased, I might be troubled, ashamed, disgusted. That would not be seemly in me. Thus, monks, as I considered the matter, all pride in my health deserted me. Again, monks, I thought, one of the uneducated many folk, etc., etc., when he sees another person subject to death, is disgusted and ashamed, forgetful that he himself is such a one. Now I too am subject to death, I have, not pa I have not passed beyond death. Were I to see another subject to death, I might be troubled, disgusted, etc. That would not be seemly in me. Thus, monks, as I considered the matter, all pride in my life deserted me. That's the end of the sutta. So in this sutta, the first the Buddha said that he had an extremely good life in his father's house. Um, at that time, Kasi was a very famous city and all kinds of good materials were got from Kasi so that he used his uh, clothes and all that turban and, and all that was from Kasi. And he had three mansions built for him for the three seasons. In India, they have three seasons, winter, summer and rainy season. And during the rainy season, when it rained a lot, he didn't go out from that mansion. He was waited on by, I think, female uh, slaves, uh, and they took care of him and he had a very pleasurable, sensual life eh? uh, uh, when he was young. And uh, even though he had such a good uh, life eh, when he was young, eh, you see this kind of thought that he used to think eh, when even when he was young, uh, when he was healthy, he was thinking that uh, if he saw an old person, eh, normally a lot of young people, when they see an old person, they are disgusted. Uh, they, they don't like to see old people. But he himself, 
he thought, nah, even though he is not old at that time, but one day he will become old. So there's nothing to be uh, disgusted about seeing somebody old because that is the state that we are going to be very soon. So in the same way, when he saw somebody diseased or sick, nah, he also thought one day when he becomes old, he will also be like that. And also when somebody uh, saw, he saw somebody uh, dead, nah, he also had that kind of feeling. Nah. Now, so you can see, yeah, uh, the Buddha, to think such thoughts uh, was quite unusual. It's not uh, everybody who is like that, nah, having such a good life and then thinking about old age and sickness and death. And then only shows uh, that in his previous life, he had already encountered the Dhamma. And this can be seen in the Gatikara Sutta, in the Majima Nikaya. It is mentioned that the Buddha in a previous life met, met the last Buddha, which was Kasapa Buddha. And at first, uh, our Bodhisatta at that time, uh, his name was Jyotipala, is our Buddha in the previous life. Uh, because he was a Brahmin, he did not want to even go and see the Buddha Kasapa. And later when he was persuaded by his friend to go and see the Buddha Kasapa, he, didn't, he, he even refused to pay respect to the Buddha Kasapa. He just said hello, hello like that and sat down to one side. But the Buddha out of compassion and also because our Jyotipala's good friend Gatikara asked the Buddha to teach him some Dhamma, so Buddha Kasapa taught him some Dhamma and after listening to the Dhamma, he made a 180 degrees turn. In other words, he gave up his religion, the Brahmin religion, and eventually renounced and became a monk. So in the previous life, the Buddha had already become a monk and cultivated. And it is possible that he had already become an Arya, a Sotapanna or something. That's why when he came back in this last life, huh, Something kept reminding him of old age, sickness and death, uh, even though he had such a good life. Um, the other thing I'd just like to mention about the Buddha is that many people have the wrong idea from reading later books uh, that the Buddha was the prince and that his father was a king. It is not true. Uh, we can see from the suttas and the Vinaya that the Buddha belonged to the Sakyan clan and his clan was a warrior clan, Katya clan or Kshatriya clan, that is the warrior clan, like a Raja or Tungku in this country. But his father was not the king because they lived in a country called Kosala. And the king of Kosala, is, it is mentioned in the suttas, the king of Kosala was Pasanadi. Asnadi was the king. And uh, the Buddha's father was not even the chief of the Sakyan clan. The chief of the Sakyan clan was a man by the name of Badia. And this man, Badia, later uh, was persuaded to renounce and became a monk under the Buddha. Uh, so we just see that uh, from the suttas uh, that the Buddha came from uh, this warrior clan family and was the father was very rich. Uh, and just now we read about how the Buddha had such a sensual life eh, of pleasure. And there's one sutta somewhere mentioned that later when the Buddha renounced and tried to practice the spiritual path, eh, his thoughts, sensual thoughts came to disturb him, you know. And that is, uh, that is something because he had, uh, he had uh, such a sensual life when he was young eh, that uh, these uh, sensual thoughts came to disturb him and, uh, obstructed him when he renounced and became a monk. But eventually, out of determination, he overcame it. The next sutta is 3.4.39. The Buddha said, Monks, there are these three forms of pride. What three? The pride of youth, the pride of health, the pride of life. The uneducated many folk, drunk with the pride of youth, practices immorality in deed, word and thought. So doing, when body breaks up after death, such a one is reborn in the waste, the woeful plains, the downfall in hell. Likewise, eh, the uneducated many folk, drunk with the pride of health, practices immorality in deed, word and thought. So doing, when body breaks up after death, 
such a one is reborn in the waste, the woeful plains, the downfall in hell. And similarly, the uneducated manifold, drunk with the pride of life, practices immorality in deed, word and thought, and so also goes down the woeful plains. And then the Buddha continues, A monk is intoxicated with the pride of youth. A monk gives up the training and falls back to the low life. So likewise, one who is intoxicated with the pride of health gives up the training and falls back to the lowly life. Similarly, a monk intoxicated with the pride of uh, life uh, gives up the training and falls back to the low life. And that's the end of the sutta. So in this sutta, the Buddha says uh, that these three things, most people uh, uh, are proud, uh, especially when they are young. Uh, the pride of youth, uh, the pride of health. When you are youthful, uh, you have very good health. So you are very proud of your health or so. And maybe you think you are very strong, your physique is very uh, good looking, etc. And the pride of life, uh, also, especially when we are young, uh, we think, uh, we never even think of death. And the thought of death doesn't even occur to us. So because of that, uh, lay persons uh, drunk with these three things, uh, youth, health and life, uh, they are not willing to practice the spiritual path. Uh, and uh, sometimes if you remind them of the spiritual path, they say, oh, wait until they are old. But they don't realize that uh, old, old age, yeah? might be something that some of them would not even see because there are some people who pass away in the, in the when they are young, some people pass away in the middle age, some people pass away in their old age. And because of the being drunk with these three things, uh, uh, pride of youth, health and life, uh, they like to enjoy life. Uh, and they enjoy life to the extent, uh, sometimes you see, uh, some people live as if uh, life is forever, you know. Uh, they just forget uh, that uh, death is not so far away. Uh, um, if we consider uh, that on the average we live up to about 70 uh, and we calculate how many years we have left, uh, it's not that many years you know, we have left. So similarly, the Buddha says, uh, a monk also drunk with these three things uh, uh, gives up the training. That means give, the training is the, the life of a monk. Uh, and falls back to the low life. The low life is the lay person's life. Uh, so uh, you see sometimes uh, some people become a monk with the intention to renounce and practice. Uh, but after a while they forget about it and they become very lax. Uh, they are not interested in meditation, etc. And also because of uh, the pride in these three things, uh, they sometimes uh, uh, even entertain thoughts of disrobing. Uh, they become satisfied, dissatisfied uh, with the robes uh, and they compare themselves with other people enjoying life. Uh, and they also think of enjoying life. Uh, so the Buddha says uh, not to be drunk with these three things, uh, these three forms of pride. You have to be very careful. Uh, we just don't know when uh, death will, will touch us. Uh. As, as the Buddha says, life is uncertain, but death is certain. Now we come to the next sutta, 3.4.40. Buddha said, Monks, there are these three forms of dominance. What three? Dominance of self, of the world, and of Dhamma. And of what sort is dominance of self? In this case, a monk who has gone to the forest, the root of a tree or a lonely spot, thus reflects. It was not for the sake of robes that I went forth from the home to the homeless life. Not for arms or lodging, not for the sake of becoming such and such. No, it was with this idea, here am I, fallen on birth, old age and death, on sorrows, lamentation and woes, on despair and tribulations. I am fallen on ill, dukkha, foredone with ill. Perhaps so doing, some ending of all this mass of ill may be revealed to me. Yet if I, who have forsaken the passions by going forth from home to the homeless life, should pursue passions still worse than before, that would be unseemly in me. Then he thus reflects, energetic shall be my striving, and my mindfulness shall be established unshaken. Calm shall, by, shall my body be, not turbulent. My mind shall be controlled and one-pointed. 
thus making self predominant, he abandons evil, cultivates goodness, abandons things blameworthy, cultivates things blameless, and keeps himself in perfect purity. This monks is called dominance of self. And of what sort monks is dominance of the world? In this case, a monk who has gone to the forest, to the root of a tree, a lonely spot, thus reflects, it was not for the sake of ropes that I went forth from, from home to the homely, to the homeless life, not for arms or lodging, not for the sake of becoming such and such. No, it was with this idea, here am I, fallen on birth, old age and death, on sorrows, lamentation and woes, on despair and tribulations, and fallen on ill, foredone with ill. Perhaps some ending of all this mass of ill may be revealed to me. Yet if I, who went forth from thus from home to the homeless life, should indulge in sensual thoughts, indulge in malicious thoughts, in harmful thoughts, great is this company of men in the world. Surely in this great company there are recluses and brahmins, possessed of supernormal powers, clairvoyant, able to read the thoughts of others. Even from afar they can see me. Though close at hand, they may be invisible, and they can read my mind with theirs. They would know me thus. Behold this clansman here, my friends, who, though in faith he went forth from the home to the homeless life, yet lives his life mixed up with things evil and unprofitable. There must be devas too, of supernormal powers, clairvoyant, able to read the thoughts of others. Even from afar they can see me. They would know me thus. Behold this clansman here, my friends, who, though in faith he went forth from the home to the homeless life, yet lives his life mixed up with things evil and unprofitable. Then he thus reflects, energetic shall be my striving, and my mindfulness shall be established unshaken. Calm shall my body be, not turbulent, my mind shall be controlled and one-pointed. Thus making the world predominant, he abandons evil, cultivates goodness, abandons things blameworthy, cultivates things blameless, and keeps himself in utter purity. This monk is called dominance of the world. And of what sort is dominance of Dhamma? In this case, a monk who has gone to the forest, etc., thus reflects, well proclaimed by the exalted one is Dhamma, seen in this very life, a thing not involving time, inviting one to come and see, leading onward to be known for themselves by the wise. Now I have fellows in the righteous life who abide in knowledge and insight. If I, who am one that went forth under this well-proclaimed Dhamma Vinaya, should dwell in sloth and negligence, it would be unseemly for me. Then he thus reflects, energetic shall be my striving, etc. Thus likewise, making Dhamma predominant, he abandons evil, cultivates goodness, abandons things blameworthy, cultivates things blameless, and keeps himself in utter purity. This monk is called dominance of Dhamma. These then are the three forms of dominance. Uh, this, this sutta is more for monks. La. And these are the three ways uh, the Buddha says that a monk can remind himself uh, to strive. La. One is based on the self, the other one is based on the world that somebody might know uh, through psychic power that he is uh, lazy, etc. And the third one is using Dhamma to remind him to strive. Uh, the other thing I like to explain here is, now and then we come across the word recluses and Brahmins. Recluses and Brahmins. This is a translation for the Pali word, uh, Samana Brahmana. This Brahmana is a caste in India. In the days of the Buddha, there were four uh, castes la, in India. The priest caste was called uh, Brahmana, and nowadays they are called Brahmins. La. And so, uh, during the Buddha's time, uh, um, the Brahmins were the priest caste. La. Then you have the warrior caste, the Katya. Then you have the merchant class, and you have the workers class, la, the lower class. La. These are the four classes. So. The, the Brahmin class, uh, they are a caste. So if somebody from another caste renounces and becomes a monk, uh, he cannot call himself Brahmana because that is only reserved for the Brahmin caste. And so any other monk uh, who renounces uh, uh, is called a Samana. That is why our Buddha is very often in the Sutta is called 
Gotama, the recluse, that's the translation for Samana Gotama. Uh, so that's what I have to say about recluses and Brahmins. Eh? Now 3.4.42, the Buddha said, Monks, a believer is to be recognized by three characteristics. What three? He desires to see the virtuous. He desires to hear Saddhamma. With heart free from the taint of stinginess, he dwells at home, a generous giver, clean-handed, delighting in giving up, one to ask a favor of, one who delights to share gifts with others. By these three characteristics, a believer is to be recognized as such. Uh, in this sutta, the Buddha says, uh, a Buddhist, uh, a believer uh, is a Buddhist, he should have three characteristics. First one, he desires to see the virtuous. Uh, actually meaning he desires to see monks. Uh, and the second one is he desires to hear Saddhamma. Saddhamma is the true Dhamma. That means he desires to hear suttas, uh, discourses of the Buddha. The third one, he is generous. Uh, he likes to uh, practice generosity instead of stinginess. Uh. Now these three qualities, uh, are, or these three things, uh, are mentioned in the Mangala Sutta as ways of getting a lot of blessings. The first one, to see monks, is called Samana Dasana. Now, if you all are familiar with the Mangala Sutta, you remember this chant, Samana, Samana Dasana. The second one is to hear suttas, is Dhamma Savanang, uh, Dhamma Savanang, to hear uh, the Dhamma. The third one is dana, generosity, uh, giving. Now, there are some people uh, nowadays, uh, they are not familiar with the suttas, and uh, they think uh, that to meditate is enough. Uh, they don't know that the Buddha's teaching is a gradual process, a gradual, the Buddha said, just as the ocean does not become deep suddenly, it slopes gently as you, you, as you walk out to the sea, uh, it, it, the, the slope uh, gen, it, it gently gets deeper and deeper and deeper, not suddenly. So the Buddha said in the same way, the training in the holy life is a gradual practice. Uh, it's a gradual practice. It's not a sudden practice. So these basic things uh, like keeping sila, keeping the moral conduct, dana, practicing charity, uh, going to see monks uh, and talking to monks and getting advice from monks, uh, hearing Dhamma, etc. All these are foundations in the Dhamma. When you practice all these, eh, then when you meditate, it helps you. Uh, just like in the Aryan Eightfold Path. In the Aryan Eightfold Path, eh, there are eight factors, and all these eight factors are to be practiced together, not just one. It's not like you practice right concentration, just right concentration. No, all eight together. So you were saying uh, that uh, all these foundations, uh, the, the the foundation in the in the holy life, in the spiritual path, uh, all these things are help. Uh, going to visit monks, hearing suttas, practicing dana, uh, uh, etc. All these are necessary. You can't uh, just jump. You know, be before learning to crawl and learning to. Uh, walk, uh, you think of uh, running, uh, it's uh, not possible. Uh, so you have to remember that foundation is very important. Otherwise, you find there are some people, they start meditating and uh, instead of uh, becoming more humble, uh, some people becoming uh, more arrogant. And that's uh, definitely they are on the wrong path because as we practice the holy life, uh, it is meant to cut our ego. That's the main purpose of the holy life because the source of our sorrow, source of our suffering is the ego. Uh, so if you practice the right path, uh, you will see year after year, you change, you become more humble, you let go of your attachments. But if the opposite happens, uh, your temper becomes bigger uh, and you become more arrogant, and a lot of things you cannot stand, you know, then you are definitely going on the wrong path. Yeah. So we have to be careful. Yeah.